So this morning, folks, well, let me say, last week, we looked at a pretty large chunk of Scripture, if you were here last week. We looked at all of chapter 7 of the book of Acts. And we saw that, that Stephen, at the end, was stoned to death. And this, as I mentioned last week, brought about a major transition in the church. Up to this point, the Holy Spirit had been received, and the first church was essentially planted in Jerusalem. And the growth was amazing, had an amazing rate of growth right from the beginning, but it was only in Jerusalem. But Jesus told his disciples just before the ascension, back in Acts chapter 1, that after the Holy Spirit came upon them, that they would be his witness in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so Stephen's death was a catalyst for moving the church into one of those two regions, Judea and Samaria. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I, want to, I would like you to join me in our focus passage this morning is Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. And I'll read. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. In Acts chapter 5, if you recall, a few weeks back, actually before Thanksgiving, we, we've been out of Acts for a while, there was a, a very well-respected Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel. And if you recall, he stood in front of the council after they had arrested Peter and John. And the council, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, they were trying to figure out what to do to, to punish Peter and John for preaching the resurrection of the dead. And Gamaliel stood up and he told the religious leaders that they really should take no action at all. And he told the council that if this is nothing more than a movement, like other movements in the past, it will just go away on its own. And they had already cut the, the head off the snake, so to speak, by putting Jesus to death. And like with the other movements, they took out the leader and then the movement just kind of faded away. And he, he added, though, that if this movement is truly from God, there won't be anything that the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, or the entire council can do to stop it. And for a while, the council listened to, to Gamaliel, and, but this fire in the church, it, it kept growing. The church grew until it, it couldn't be controlled anymore. And that was the risk that the leaders, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders of the time, were losing their power. The crowds, the communities were moving, were believing in Jesus. Now, it's interesting, though, that Gamaliel was also the mentor and teacher of another young man named Saul. And I purposely passed over this verse last week, verse 58 of chapter 7. But it's the same Saul. Gamaliel's student is the same Saul that we see in chapter 7, verse 58, where the young man is as they're stoning Stephen, those who were throwing the stones at Stephen and, and killing him, uh, place their garments at Saul's feet. And we see this morning in verse 1 that Saul approved of the stoning of Stephen. And clearly, Saul's life experiences and, and feelings overruled his education and his self-discipline. And that led to my first point, talking point this morning, a great persecution. Our passage this morning says, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. 
Now, I'm assuming everyone is familiar with and has sat around probably, or at least you know a lot, a campfire is, right? But have you ever tried to stomp one out? What happens when you try to stomp out a campfire? Little embers start to fly up, right? And if the wind catches them, they blow and they can create fires in other places. And the more you jump on it, the more you scatter those embers. And fires spring up all over the place. That's exactly what happened here. They started jumping all over the embers of the church in Jerusalem. And all that did was send these embers out into Judea and Samaria. And that's how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit turns negatives into positives. He turns disasters into miracles. He likes to take those challenges, those tragedies, and he turns them into victories for the glory of God. But at the end of verse 1, Luke tells us the apostles remained in Jerusalem, though. And the other disciples scattered out into Judea and Samaria. And this is interesting because when the devil wants to destroy a church, he will typically attack the leadership first. Because if he can destroy the leadership, then it's pretty easy to, to get to the flock and get them to scatter. And then that's just the end of the church. And what we see here is God's divine intervention. We see God protecting and keeping the apostles safe. I used the analogy of a fire a minute ago, or a campfire. But there's a, another fire that I also think lends itself here as an analogy. Any of you fans of the Olympics? I, I love the Olympics. Love watching the Olympics. And the Olympic flame, when the Olympics are coming around, travels around by torchbearers. And they light the flame, though, in Athens. And then torchbearers carry it to wherever the next city is that's hosting the Olympics. And then they light the big torch in that city, for, and it burns for the duration of the games, and then they put the big torch, the big flame, out. Four years later, when the next Olympics are held in another host city, wherever it is in the world, they don't carry the flame from, the, from that host city to the next host city. They go back to Athens, and they relight the flames, and they carry it. It's always originated from Athens. Keeping the apostles in Jerusalem is kind of like the flame in Athens. It enabled their protection, but it also ensured continuity by having a centralized, authoritative source for settling any disputes that came up, uh, to correct and rebuke, and to validate God's teaching. They were the original flame. Now, I think there's an important lesson for us here. And the lesson is... Not just that the Holy Spirit turns setbacks into triumphs. The lesson is that comfort and ease and prosperity and safety and freedom often cause an inertia in the church. Inertia. It's a big word we don't use very often, don't hear very often in our day-to-day. -day. So what does inertia mean? It's a, it's a tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged. The very things that we think would produce an energy and growth in a, in a church or the, the cause of Christ or the kingdom instead produce again and again the exact opposite. It creates apathy and self-centeredness and false sense of security. And we see this in the, the state of European and American churches compared to those churches in countries where persecution directly impacts the depth of of faith in churches. God's plan was not for the church to get comfortable and stagnate in Jerusalem. So he took Satan's attempt to stomp out the church and he used it. He set the church in motion, an unchanging motion that the, the church is still called to today. Jesus confirms this idea in the parable of the sower. In the parable of the sower, it's told in, in Matthew and in, and in Mark, some seeds, Jesus says, fall on the rocky ground, and they, they sprout, but then they wither under the, the heat of the sun because they don't have a deep root. But maybe even more true is that more people are like the third seed that falls in the parable, among the thorns, and they're, they're choked out. In Mark 4.19, it says, but... The cares of the world, 
and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the Word. And it proves unfruitful. Persecution, folks, can have a huge impact on a church. But prosperity may be even more devastating to the mission that God calls us to. The point is not that we we should seek persecution. I'm not saying that. But that we should be very wary of prosperity and comfort too. And we should not be disheartened. We should be, as Jesus tells His disciples in Matthew chapter 5. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Going back to our passage, Luke next tells us about an honored man. That's my second point this morning. The great persecution came about because of Stephen. And there's a, a story about a, a missionary in Egypt, and he's returned and he's presenting in, the, in America to an American audience. Like so often happens in American churches, we have our missionaries come and visit us and tell us how their, their ministries are going. And this ministry talked about a fellow missionary who saw a little Arab Muslim boy drowning in the water. And the missionary ran into the water to try to save this little boy. But in the end, the missionary ended up dying, and the, the little boy was able to make it to shore. And somebody commented to the missionary afterwards about the, the sacrifice of his fellow missionary. And they said, it, isn't it rather pointless for a well-trained, well-equipped, strategic-thinking individual like a missionary to give his life for a Muslim Arab boy? And maybe we should ask the same question this morning in the case of Stephen. With all the gifts that Stephen had, and with after all the wonders and signs that he did, and the the power of the Spirit was with him, he was clearly a Spirit-filled person. Remember, Acts chapter 6 tells us that when he was selected as one of those deacons to, to help solve some of the problems that were coming up in the church as it was growing. We might ask, why was it necessary for his ministry to be so short? Why did it have to cost him his life? Why did it have to happen? Isn't it rather pointless? And isn't it always hotheads like that who bring trouble, though? Now, the whole city's against the church. What a waste of life. Look at the families and the children who are being broken up. Look at the homes being lost. The children being taken away from all their friends. Now we have to live like refugees in a a place that we don't like, exiles in Judea and Samaria. What was he thinking? Why didn't he just keep his mouth shut? You see, that's the human way of interpreting. But when Luke tells us God's version of the story... Stephen is a man full of grace and power. And here in Acts chapter 8, verse 2, Luke says that devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Now these devout men, most commentaries do not think Luke was referring to Christians here. If he was referring to Christians, he would have said something like believers or brothers or, or something like that. Devout men is a a term that is usually linked to pious Jews. We should read this verse like this. There were some Jews in Jerusalem, though not Christians, who still believed that the murder of Stephen was wrong. That's how we should interpret Acts 8, verse 2. And this is interesting because criminals, according to Jewish law, They had to have a burial. They couldn't just let the body lay around. They had to be buried. But the the law also said that they were forbidden to weep or lament over the body because the person was a criminal. And here you, you have a direct protest to these devout men who not only buried Stephen, but also lamented over him. So in a very real sense, what we're we're seeing here is these men were, were protesting against Stephen's murder. And note, Stephen is honored, not blamed, for the persecution that came about because of his his sermon in Acts chapter 7. 
Worldly people might be more worried about the consequences of such things. But godly people who, who think the way Jesus thinks about life don't worry about such things. When persecution comes, because of courageous, faithful, God-honoring obedience, godly people don't blame the servant of the Lord. They honor them like these men are doing. And this persecution created a challenge for the believers. Uh, a faith that was challenged. I'd like to ask you a really hard question this morning. What would need to happen for you to give up your faith? A divorce? Death of a loved one? Family difficulties? Personal challenges? Now I understand that many of us can't answer that question until we actually experience it. But I know Christians, even in this church, who have gone through and are still going through some very difficult times in their lives. And I thank God that they are still holding strong to the faith that they have in Jesus. You see, when, when Saul got wind that there were Christians meeting, that sent fear throughout the whole church. And they were frightened. They were frightened, but they, they wouldn't give up their faith. And even though some were caught and thrown into horrible jails, some were brought before the council in the synagogue and they were pressured trying to get them to force them to deny Jesus, they wouldn't give up their faith in God. Now Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, and we'll see that in a few weeks, in Acts chapter 2, now Paul, he wrote, he persecuted the followers in this way to their death arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. That's Acts chapter 22, verse 4. And a little while later, he says in Acts 26, verse 10, Paul goes on to say, And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. These Christians would rather die than deny their faith in Christ. Paul carries this on a little further in Acts 26, verse 11, by saying, Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. Paul said that he had many Christians beaten and punished, and they wouldn't deny their faith in Christ. So what would it take for you to give up your faith? I pray that there's nothing in this world, no circumstances that can be thrown at us in this life that would cause us to give up our faith. Because when you think about it, it's our faith in Christ that helps us through many of those life-challenging, difficult situations. Now, I said earlier that God allowed the evilness of wicked men to, to happen so that the church, or better, the gospel, could spread. And, and that's what Luke tells us about next. A powerful word, a powerful gospel. In the remaining verses of our passage, verses 4 through 8, let me read those again. It says, Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed them the Christ, and the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of men who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. And this brings me to my final point this morning. We, we've seen the persecution in verses 1 through 3. Now we see what it produces. The believers who were scattered were, were spreading the gospel to new places. You can only imagine the conversations that were, that were going on with those who fled. They would flee to a town and be recognized as a stranger. Any strange person would coming into a new town. And they might, someone might say to them, well, what brings you to so-and-so a town? And they might say, well, I'm, I'm fleeing for my life. And 
How so might be the response. And then the gospel would flow freely. I'm from Jerusalem. You know, I was I was living there. My, me and my family, we were content in our religion. And I loved the temple. I loved the sacrifices. I loved the law. But then this day, this one day this guy Jesus came to town. And he was a religious leader. And he claimed to, to be the Messiah. But the religious leaders, they weren't having any of that. They crucified him. Can you believe it? But here's the thing. He rose from the dead. Everyone else who, had, who had, I've seen crucified has died. And the Romans, they crucified many. And they stayed dead. But not this Jesus guy. He rose from the dead and he appeared to his disciples. And then they, and they fled Jerusalem with their, their teaching about Jesus. They said that Jesus is the, the fulfillment of Psalm 16. That the Messiah would rise from the dead. They said that Jesus is the stone that, the, that was rejected by the builders. And, but He's become the cornerstone. They said there's a, a salvation in no one else, but no one else but the name of Jesus. And you know what? I've come to believe it. I've come to believe in Jesus and the forgiveness of sins. He is the one that all the prophets spoke about. There are thousands who have come to faith in Jerusalem. The community has been an incredible experience. I've never experienced such love before. All was going well until recently. And one of our own, this good man named Stephen, godly, spirit-filled man, he was just stoned to death by the council. And Stephen, he was just the first. This guy saw, he started going around house to house, rounding up other believers. And so I left Jerusalem for my own safety. But I'll tell you, it's all worth it. Jesus gave Himself for me. So I've given my all to Jesus. I will never deny Him. I will press on until my final day. That's the kind of witnessing opportunities that must have taken place throughout all Judea and Samaria. But did you notice? Notice exactly who was doing the preaching. It wasn't the apostles. They were back in Jerusalem. It was your average, typical believer. This is really a call to us to be doing the same thing. The book of Acts is calling not just pastors to preach the Word. It's for all believers are called to preach the Word, including you, if you are indeed a believer in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're thinking, yeah, but I, I'm not trained in that. I don't, I don't know how to do it. You know, Jesus simply calls us to be His witness. To speak whatever you've experienced. Simply tell others what you know. This is what a witness on a, a witness stand is called to do. They just tell the court what they know, what they saw. Tell others of your experiences with Jesus. Tell others that you have trusted in Christ for forgiveness of sins. Tell others what you read in the Bible. Tell others of the, the thoughts about Jesus that fill your mind. You don't have to be an expert. You don't even have to have all the answers. You just have to be willing. It's your testimony. No one can tell you you're wrong. It's yours. And just because you don't know the answer to the objections of others, it doesn't mean that Jesus isn't real and that your faith isn't true. No. In verse 5, we get introduced to this man named Philip. And throughout the rest of chapter 8, we will hear much about Philip and his ministry. And like Stephen, he was one of the seven chosen, right? To serve the, the widows in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. He was also full of the Holy Spirit, just like Stephen. It says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. So Philip went to Samaria, and, and the Samaritans were a, a mixed descent, coming 
from the intermarriage of Jews and the Assyrians who had invaded years, hundreds of years maybe before. So they were Gentiles. It was a mix between Gentiles and Jews. And the Samaritans were considered to be unclean by the Jews. If a Jew walking down the street saw a Samaritan walking towards him, the Jew would cross the street to avoid being too close to a Samaritan because they were unclean. In John chapter 4, verse 9, when Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, remember Jesus, as he's traveling, he goes through Samaria. And all of his disciples are saying, Jesus, what are you doing? We are not in a land where we're welcome. And he comes to the well and he meets the woman at the well. And she says to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews don't associate with us. And then further down in the same chapter of John, she says to Jesus, in John chapter 4, she says, sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. And the Samaritan woman had no problem believing what Jesus had claimed. In fact, she went back into her town and she practiced what I'm preaching about this morning. She told everyone what happened to her and that she met Jesus. And the Bible says in John chapter 4, verses 39 to 41, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did, she said. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days, and because of his words, many became believers. Despite the previous fears against the Samaritans, Philip went down to Samaria. And he watered the seed that Christ had planted, that Jesus had planted when he spoke to the woman at the well and the other Samaritans from that town. Now, what exactly did Philip preach? He preached Christ, Christ crucified. Philip preached Jesus as the promised Messiah. And as we've all seen with the, the words of the Samaritan woman, and the Samaritans may have been familiar with Philip's message. They had heard it. And this message that Philip priest hit home for many Samaritans. And that that message was validated as being true and from God because God confirmed it through Philip, through signs and wonders. He was doing miracles down there. People who were sick were healed. People who were paralyzed and lame, they were able to walk again. And those who were demon-possessed, the demons were driven out of them. And the message... And the signs and wonders that confirmed the message caused Samaria to be filled with joy. That's exactly what good news does, doesn't it? It brings joy. And Acts verse 8 says, So there was much joy in that city. Joy and the gospel always go together. Believing in Jesus and receiving forgiveness of sin brings joy to the heart. And in this case, joy was throughout the city because there were many in Samaria who had believed in Jesus and believed the gospel. Now, as I get ready to land the plane this morning, there are are a couple takeaways from this verse that I want us to try to apply. And the first is that we must remember that comfort and ease 
and prosperity and safety and freedom often cause inertia in the church, which can result in unhealthy apathy and stagnation. We have to guard against that. Second, when persecution comes because of courageous, faithful, God-honoring obedience, godly people don't blame the servant of the Lord for it. They honor them. Third, our faith in Christ is what truly helps us through many of life's circumstances. When tough times come, we shouldn't get mad at God and we shouldn't run from God. We should run to God. And fourth, this is a is really a call to, to us all to evangelism. The book of Acts is calling not just pastors to preach the word, but all believers are called to preach the word, tell their story, be witnesses. And then the last one, number five, comes in the form of some questions to reflect on this week. How is your joy in the Lord doing? When was the last time you woke up and said, you just thank God for the, the joyful heart, for healing your sinful heart? Do you ever just take a moment out of your busy day, out of your busy schedule to think about what God has done for you and, and for each one of us? I know a lot of Christians who never rejoice in the Lord. They go around living their, their Christian life as if, they, as if they've been baptized into, I don't know, tomato juice. Paul says in Ephesians 5, verses 19 and 20, Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I also know a lot of Christians who do that. They love to sing songs to God. They wake up singing. They sing when they're making a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or when they're making dinner. I don't know how true it is, but they, they say one of the, the most infectious things in the world is a smile. Folks, when a, a Christian is full of joy, it's infectious. And others want to know what that's all about. They want a piece of that joy too. Just think about the, the joy that we could bring the, the Valentine, the Mission, the Crookston, Kilgore, all the surrounding communities, wherever we're at this week. My closing prayer this morning comes from Colossians chapter 1. It's a, a prayer I have for all of us this morning. It's always good to, to pray God's Word back to Him. So let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Lord, we pray that we may live a life worthy of You and may please You in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of You, being strengthened with all power according to Your glorious might so that we may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.